Hey everybody, Ryan here. Welcome back to our pharmacology series. A lot of my backers over on Patreon have asked me to continue where I left off on pharmacology, so here we are. In these next two videos, we'll talk about general principles of pharmacology, including pharmacokinetics in this video and pharmacodynamics in the next. So pharmacokinetics is all about what the body does to the drug. In other words, how a drug moves through the body from administration all the way to elimination. Now this has nothing to do with what the drug binds to, therapeutic effects, toxic effects, all of that has to do with pharmacodynamics, which again we'll talk about in the following video. So administration is how a drug is delivered. Why I call this step zero is because it's really a pre-step for pharmacokinetics. Oral administration is ingestion through the mouth, probably the most common, your over-the-counter tablets, Tylenol, Motrin, several, many examples of that. Sublingual administration is when the drug is dissolved under the tongue. An example of this would be nitroglycerin for angina or heart attack. Subcutaneous or sub-Q is injected under the skin. An example of this would be insulin injection for diabetics. IM is short for intramuscular or injected into the muscle. So an EpiPen inserted into the thigh tissue for a severe allergic reaction is an example of that. IV is short for intravenous and that's injected into a vein. So a depressant administered for IV sedation, like if you're getting your wisdom teeth taken out, would be an example of IV administration. Inhalation is when the drug is breathed in. So this would be, for example, an albuterol inhaler used for an asthma attack. And lastly, we have topical, which is applied directly to the skin or the mucous membrane. So topical lidocaine, that a dentist uses to make the local anesthetic injection more tolerable for the patient would be an example of this administration. So all of these are examples of how a drug is initially delivered to the patient. So the first real step we have is absorption. This is how does a drug get into the body. So drugs must cross epithelial and or endothelial cell layers in order to enter the body. So epithelial cells of the skin, the respiratory system, gastrointestinal, and genitourinary tracts separate the inside environment from the outside environment. And once through the epithelium, most drugs must also pass through the endothelium, which is the lining of the blood vessels, and then enter the blood for systemic distribution through the rest of the body. Now local drugs are administered and active at the site of administration. So this would be topical anesthetic, local anesthetic. They really have no need to get into the bloodstream, whereas systemic drugs need to enter the bloodstream, which is a highway to the rest of the body. And I'll refer to the bloodstream as the highway in several analogies I have throughout this video. So the typical route for a systemic drug, which is what we'll be focusing on, would be from the lumen through the apical membrane, which is on the outside of these cells, through the basolateral membrane, which is on the inside of these cells, through the interstitium or the interstitial fluid, then through the endothelium or the lining of, let's say, a capillary here, and then finally into the blood. Now there are a lot of membranes that the drugs have to cross through. So drugs cross these plasma membranes by passive diffusion, facilitated diffusion, or active transport. Most drugs pass through the epithelium by passive diffusion, but drugs must be neutrally charged or hydrophobic or non-ionized, all of those being synonymous, to cross plasma membranes by passive diffusion. And that'll be really important, as you'll see in the next slide. The last definition I will introduce here is bioavailability, which refers to a fraction of a drug dose that reaches the general circulation, or the blood. By definition, 
bioavailability of a drug is never 100%. There's always some loss through all this transport, unless it's administered intravenously, because then it has no barriers to cross and gets injected directly into the highway of the body. So pH is actually incredibly important to the absorption process, and the acid or base properties of a drug, often described by its pKa, and the pH of the various body fluids, are important considerations for absorption. Now most drugs are either weak acids or weak bases. Weak acids tend to concentrate in high pH compartments, whereas weak bases tend to concentrate in low pH compartments. And this is because the non-ionized form of a drug can freely cross those plasma membranes, but the ionized form gets locked inside compartments. So a weak acid in a basic environment will be more present in its charged form and be more locked inside. So for example, weak acids are excreted more rapidly in urine with high pH because those weak acids are then concentrated in the lumen of the kidney tubule in their ionized form. From our local anesthetics videos, a lower pKa means a stronger acid, meaning it will give up its proton faster and become its non-ionized form, which allows it to be absorbed through membranes. So for, for optimal absorption, for weak acids, we want an environmental pH lower than its pKa value. So we would have more non-ionized form. And the opposite would be true for weak bases. So they too can be more non-ionized and passively diffuse where we want them to go. And this table basically summarizes that information. All right, so step number two is distribution. Once the drug is absorbed into the body, how does it get to the target site? Most drugs must reach the blood in order to be distributed effectively. We talked about this, the highway to the rest of the body. And of course, most topical drugs, like we mentioned before, are an obvious exception to this. But once in the blood, systemic drugs travel on the highway and distribute to various tissues and body water compartments according to their specific properties. So once they arrive, they exit the blood. Again, they have to go through the endothelium of the capillaries, through the interstitium, and then through the basolateral membrane of that specific cell type. And it makes sense that generally, a systemic drug will be distributed to vessel-rich organs first, like the heart, the brain, liver, lungs, and kidneys. After an oral drug is swallowed, it often, or of course, enters the gastrointestinal tract. Where else would it go? Eventually, it's absorbed by the digestive system, not necessarily the stomach, and actually it could be any of these possible colored routes that the drug gets absorbed. And these different colored routes represent the hepatic portal system. After entering the hepatic portal system, it enters this black structure called the portal vein, and then into the liver before it's sent out the rest of the body. So the liver, as we will soon talk about, metabolizes many drugs, sometimes so much so that just a small fraction of active drug remains by the time it enters the circulatory system. So this first pass through the liver, called the first pass effect, therefore greatly reduces the bioavailability of an oral drug as the liver actively tries to destroy it during this first pass. Another important consideration for distribution is volume of distribution. And this describes the distribution of drug across the three body water compartments. So before we dive into this too in depth, let's look at this diagram over here. The average adult human male weighs about 75 kilograms and is about 60% water, represented by this darker blue color, and 40% other tissues. Drugs distribute into body fluids. So 
the volume of distribution describes the distribution of a drug across these three body water compartments, those being plasma, interstitial fluid, and intracellular fluid. And all three of these, 4%, 16%, and 40% respectively, add up to 60% of total body weight. And this is crucial when you're actually calculating the rate of drug clearance, which of course you don't need to know for the board exam. The volume of distribution is the volume measured in liters of total body water into which a drug will partition, starting in the plasma and then diffusing out into the interstitial fluid and intracellular water compartments. Now actual VD values are only reported for a 75 kilogram quote unquote average man. So it's safest to divide VD by 75 kilograms and then divide, by, divide the dose by the individual patient's weight to customize it for a specific patient. Again, much more in depth than we need to know. Generally, women, obese, and older people generally have less body water than this average man. Adipose having a, the lowest water con content of any tissue type and brain and muscle having the highest water content. So generally, they should be given a lower dose because there are less body fluids for the drug to distribute into, and this percentage would be correspondingly lower. Remember, drugs typically travel through these membranes and barriers via passive diffusion in their hydrophobic or non-ionized form. So if serum proteins like albumin and globulins get bound to these drugs, they essentially lower the volume of distribution and less of that drug is distributed to the bodily fluids and more is trapped in the bloodstream and can't get out. So think of it like a traffic jam on the highway and you can't reach your exit. So that's a little bit, a very general overlook of volume of distribution. This can get a lot more complicated. There are a lot of calculations involved with this. Again, way outside the scope of the board exam, but I do have a separate video on volume of distribution if you're interested in getting a little bit more mathematical. So the third step of pharmacokinetics is metabolism. And this is how a drug molecule is chemically altered by the body. So metabolism mostly occurs in the liver. The drug is essentially run through a conveyor belt of reactions named phase one and phase two. Both reactions reduce the drug efficacy and increase polarity of the drug molecules, preventing our passive diffusion and facilitating renal and gastrointestinal clearance. Not all drugs undergo phase one and phase two. Some just undergo phase one and others just phase two. But the ultimate goal here is still the same, to render the drug inactive so it doesn't stay active indefinitely because all drugs have unwanted side effects and we need them to stop working eventually. Phase one is called functionalization and involves changing the functional characteristics of the drug by performing redox reactions, adding or removing electrons, or hydrolysis, breaking the molecule apart with water. Oxidation is the most common of these. And it's typically, this sort of reaction is organized and carried out by cytochrome P450. Phase two is called conjugation and involves covalently attaching these large polar side chains to the drug. Glucouronide conjugation, which involves bonding glucouronic acid to the drug, is the most common of these. And this enzyme carries out that reaction. An example of this, acetaminophen, trade name Tylenol, undergoes phase one reduction and phase two glutathionation. And then after this point, it's rendered inactive in this form. And finally, we have clearance or elimination, these being synonymous. How is the drug eliminated from the body? 
So after it served its purpose, after it served its purpose, we need to get rid of it. And how does that process happen? So clearance or elimination of the drug occurs mostly in the kidneys, but not always. So we have the drug, it's entered the bloodstream into the liver, and it undergoes metabolism. Phase one, like we just talked about, makes molecules more polar, which facilitates clearance through urine in the kidneys. Phase two makes molecules more polar and larger because we're covalently bonding these large polar side chains, which tends to facilitate clearance through feces in the gastrointestinal tract. Now this is a bit of an over overgeneralization here since metabolites after phase one can be excreted in feces and after phase two can be excreted in urine. But you know how I like to simplify things for the best retention. So this diagram can hopefully help with that. So for elimination, we have first order kinetics and zero order kinetics. For first order kinetics, a constant fraction of the drug is eliminated per unit time, usually in hours. So a percent of the drug is eliminated every hour. The rate, therefore, is proportional to the concentration of drug administered. And this is more common. Most drugs are eliminated via first order kinetics. For zero order kinetics, a constant amount of drug is eliminated. So this means there's no concern for how much of the drug was administered. No matter if you take a little bit of the drug or a lot of the drug, the same amount of drug will be eliminated per unit time. This is less common. Therefore, although overaccumulation of a drug in the body can occur with repeated doses in both first and zero order kinetics, the risk of accumulation is greater for drugs that follow zero order kinetics because there is no proportionality to the amount of drug administered. And finally, we have to consider drug-drug interactions. And this is where everything we just talked about really comes together in a practical sense. So one drug can affect the pharmacokinetics of another drug, most commonly step three, metabolism. So induction involves drug number one, inducing that those liver cytochrome, like P450 enzymes, resulting in increased metabolism and a reduced effect of drug number two. And then the opposite is inhibition, where drug number one competes for metabolism or directly inhibits those cytochromes, resulting in decreased metabolism and increased toxicity of drug number two. So in other words, induction of metabolism causes a reduced effect of one drug, inhibition of metabolism causes increased effect and risk of toxicity of a drug. So both of these have negative impacts on opposite ends of the spectrum. Now you can take a screenshot of this slide if you like for reference. This is an ex this is really quite a few examples of dental drugs and how different drugs can interact with those and what sort of effect they would have on the body. And all of these are interacting and impacting certain steps of pharmacokinetics. So to review, the effectiveness of a drug is influenced by numerous factors. From the prescribed dose to the administered dose, we didn't really talk about this, but mistakes can be made. There can be medical errors, patient compliance if the prescription is not filled, or if the patient doesn't take the proper doses at the proper time. The administered dose changes through the active dose by these pharmacokinetic steps we talked about. At each step in the process, we're losing some bioavailability of the drug. And finally, from active dose to the intensity of action, this has to do with the drug receptor interaction which is pharmacodynamics, and we'll talk all about that in the next video. 
All right, so that's it for this video on pharmacokinetics. Thank you so much for watching, everyone. If you're interested in supporting the channel, please check out my Patreon page. A huge thank you to Michael Raja, Eins Lau, David Jaden, Yannet, and all of my patrons for all of their support. You can unlock extras like access to my video slides to take notes on and practice questions for the board exams, so go check that out. The link will be in the description below. Thanks again for watching, everyone. I'll see you all in the next video.